Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Roundhouse Crosstalk, a podcast hosted by the California State Railroad Museum. In this week's episode, Amanda sits down with Mary White, as somebody who's written quite extensively on um, the Ekaban boxes in Japanese bullet trains. We learn all about um, the wonders of researching food culture and what that can say about um, different regions around the world, as well as uh, what eating is like on Japanese bullet trains. So without further ado, let's get into the interview. All right, wonderful. Um, so first of all, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I'm uh, lucky to be uh, an anthropologist. I think anthropology is, uh, you know, as they say, it's making the strange normal and the normal strange. And that's kind of this idea of paying attention to something so much that it takes on a new color, it takes on light, and uh, and you begin to see something that otherwise might, might be very small, you know, like a cup of coffee, mm-hmm. and it becomes a whole world. And so I do have a lot of fun. I started... Um, being mostly interested in Japan, which is still my main focus. Um, actually, in high school, when my thought was, you know, how far away from home can I get? And Japan looked like a good bet for being pretty far away from home. And I started, you know, other people were interested in France, and that wasn't that's great, but it's not very far. So I started thinking about it. I majored in Japanese anthropology as an undergraduate in the late 50s, and um, nobody else was much doing it. And uh, because, you know, there wasn't any anime and manga yet for people to get excited about, but it was really thrilling. And finally, on my first plane ride, and on my first foreign country, uh, in 1963, I get to go to Japan. So it it was amazing. So I've stuck with it. I'm also lucky enough to have become a food anthropologist, although food wasn't studied at all in a serious way when I was an undergraduate or even a graduate student. In fact, my graduate advisor would tell me, take all that food stuff off your resume if you want to get a serious job. So, and I had been a caterer, I had been a cookbook writer, I had done all this stuff, but he said, bury it, bury it, you won't be taken seriously. So lucky enough to live long enough for food to be, um, you know, a going concern. So now I call myself a food anthropologist. I do write a lot about food. And my most recent book was um, on cafes as social spaces in Japan and on coffee itself, which is, you know, the most drunk social beverage in Japan. So there's a lot of good stuff out there still to do. My next project is actually going to be um, a study of value in Japanese whiskey. So. (laughs) Oh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, whether I'm going to get um, taken seriously or not, it's just going to be of great interest to me and I think some other people, too. So I have been recently interested <clears throat> in um, food on the move, uh, moving food, which I, I've just come from an, uh, a conference Um, at Oxford University in England um, that was dedicated to food on the move. And so I got to talk about food on the trains of Japan. And this um, is kind of, I, 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 I don't like to use the word unique lightly, but it is kind of a unique experience. The what the relationship between food and the train experience Uh, in Japan. So that's um, something I started to do research about. What's the history of it? Um, And whenever I'm in Japan, you know, I indulge in as many of the uh, train meal boxes uh, as possible. So I have, uh, you know, theoretically, that's my research. Mm -hmm. You get lots of firsthand experience with today's topic. Wonderful. (laughs) 
And um, this is a little bit on topic, off topic, but I'm just curious. I read an article the other day about how alcohol consumption in young people in Japan is like plummeting and they're trying to encourage young people to drink alcohol more. Do you know anything about that? Um, yeah, I know a little bit about it. Only what anybody can read, though. Um, uh. <laughs> but what is happening is that the marketers, um, I mean, yeah, uh, it's true. Alcohol is... Uh, young people think, oh, well, that's what granddad did. You know, he went to the bars after work. Really? And, and I don't want to do that. You know, that's not fun. Um, but uh, among other another alcohol liquor companies, uh, Suntory has uh, produced a something called Toki, which is a whiskey really for, you know, Millennials, I guess, um, and um, but they're really interested in making um, bars fun and not sort of old guy places. Um, and uh, the uh, they they've even made a machine called the Toki Bar Machine, which doses out the exact amount of whiskey to make a highball. Now highballs were drunk, you know, sixty years ago. And that was the old guy drink. Um, but now the new one, the high boru, is really a young person's drink. And it's cool. And, and, and you go and have it done at the bar. And so, yeah, there's a move to get people interested. Um, sure. I mean, the, uh, the idea of you know driving yourself to drink is not at all a young person's idea, nor is it really an old person's idea either. Mm -hmm. So could you define food anthropology uh, for us? What kind of insights can you gain into a culture and a society by analyzing the kinds of foods they eat? Yeah, uh, food is, is really a topic that has been underplayed. And everybody eats. And everybody eats in very different ways and with very different local meanings. Um, they might eat similar things, you know, a starch, a vegetable, but they they understand food differently. The meanings given to food are very different. Who eats with whom is a topic in food anthropology. You know, it's called commensality, eating together. Is it, um, you know, I mean, there's, I think when, when I was growing up, families ate together at a table and that was the family meal was a thing. And that seems to have declined a bit um, because individual schedules or individual tastes or individualism per se has kind of driven people apart in their schedules uh, and perhaps in their even in their desires to have something called a family meal. So that, you know, that's not necessarily a universal question. So the, the culture surrounding eating, but also the culture surrounding the food itself. Um, my son just wrote a book called Meat Planet, which is all about the ideas behind the future of food that are embodied in this move to make meat in the laboratory. To, mm -hmm. And so there's, there's a lot of discussion about the ethics of eating that is also part of a food anthropologist's purview. So, uh, you know, that you just about anything, how you eat, what knife and fork, if you use that, how, how or chopsticks, or what is it that conveys the food to your mouth? It could be your hand. And so there's nothing uh, about food that really isn't in that range for a food anthropologist to study. Mm -hmm. so I've done a book now on food workers in Japan and the food workers cultures of making, the making of the tools for eating or the tools for making food, the making of the knife, the making of the food with the knife, the conveyance, you know, everything about it uh, has layers of meaning. So I could go on. <laughs> That's fascinating. It's all about those little things, the little details that we kind of overlook, but they mean so much. Yeah, absolutely. And you can weave stories. And I, I particularly, when I write about food, I'm writing about people mm -hmm. and the ways in which people see their habits or their 
practice or their work. Um, and I get stories from people. That's the most fun. Could you tell us a little bit more about your personal experience dining on bullet trains? Sure. Um, um, well, the bullet train is a relatively recent phenomenon in Japan. And when I say relatively recently, I mean 1964. So that's <laughs> it's all context. Um, <clears throat> my first trip was just before the bullet trains went into service. And um, so I was riding on regular trains that didn't achieve that high speed. Um, and the trains took longer. So there was actually more time to uh, eat the meal that you had brought on board. One of the problems of the bullet train is it's almost too fast. And the people who love these ekiben, as they're called, the station lunch, the station mailbox, um, really kind of regret that they've got to do it all so fast because they're going to get to Osaka before they've finished their meal. And maybe they bought two and they want to finish those. So the, the, the eating on the train though now isn't always eating on bullet trains. Bullet trains are not everywhere. They're just certain routes. But so my typical experience would be going from Tokyo to Kyoto or Tokyo to Osaka. So that's the an old pilgrimage line, pilgrimage path along which these super fast trains go. Um, and you can get there three or three grades of bullet trains. So you can have a super fast, a fast and a medium fast train. Um, and the, the prices are according to speed. Mm -hmm. um, what you do though, is you, you in the stations, uh, you visit all of these stands, kind of mini stalls, uh, where there are could be hundreds of different possible possible meal meal boxes to take on board. The trains do not serve food on board. You mm -hmm. bring the food from the station. And eki ben eki means station ben means meal box, um, short for bento and. The idea of the choosing is one of the great pleasures of travel, choosing your meal. And it's going to be your meal. It's a meal that it's in a box in front of you on the train. Mm -hmm. It is not a shared thing. It's, so it's very personal. And you have all this amazing selection. There is no one saying, oh, but you're supposed to have this one with, you know, but there is a tendency to try to get something very local. Mm -hmm. One of the great things about Ekiben is uh, they display the enormous regionalism of Japanese food. Japanese food is not a singular cuisine, not at all. You, When it leaves Japan, people call it Japanese food. But within Japan, it's food from you know Kumamoto or food from... Hokkaido, or even more particular small micro regions. So that's what you're going for. You're going for the food that represents a place. Mm -hmm. Even as you're traveling at high speeds through the country that on trains that kind of tie the whole country together. Mm -hmm. So there's a wonderful, almost paradoxical thing about eating regional and traveling nationally. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the joys. So my experiences over all of these decades have been, um, you know, very greedy ones. You know, I want, <laughs> I know when I get to a certain station, uh, if you can possibly, uh, sometimes, sometimes there are people who come on boards selling a local box, mm -hmm. but usually you pick them up yourself at the station. So you're not taking a chance, you know. Um, is it socially taboo to share one of these boxes with the person you're sitting with? No, it's not. But you you really have this self-indulgent moment, which is mm. not a typical moment in Japan, you know, mm. and certainly not in public. So you're being private in public in a way that is very um, pleasurable. Mm -hmm. You have, yeah, I know, of course. And you can see moms um, with chopsticks, you know, giving a sample of something to a child next to her, you know, uh, feeding a child out of her box or, you know, there's sure, of course they're showing, but you don't see it typically. Mm -hmm. 
And um, what are the distinctive features of an ecuban? Like uh, if our listeners wanted to imagine one of these sitting in front of them, what might one look like? Well, usually an ecuban, and there are so many uh, types, uh, an ecuban typically will be a rectangular box with sections divided by little um, you know, cardboard or bamboo or something. And there will be different foods in different sections. A, a very typical box would be called a, a makunouchi bento. They, they come out of an old theater tradition, theater and sumo wrestling matches. And bento are served in these traditional theaters and in traditional sumo uh, tournaments. So, and those boxes are... Um, for eating between the acts Mm -hmm. and they are and you eat at your seat in the old days it would just be sitting on tatami matting in little boxes so you're you know you're just eating your meal and that meal would have in it everything that would comprise you know traditionally a meal a balanced Mm -hmm. meal so there would be you know protein usually or maybe some chicken or some fish or some tofu. Um, there would be there would always be rice. You know the old idea that it isn't a meal without rice is present, and but everything will be beautiful, and mm-hmm. that's another feature. It should be very very attractive. The old Japanese expression "me de taberu" means we eat with our eyes, mm. and that aesthetic component. It should be attractive. It should represent at least five different colors. Mm -hmm. So an orange, a green, a yellow, a brown, um, et cetera. So everything about it would comprise the elements of a meal not served on a train. But there is something very different about it, which, first of all, it's all served at once. You know, it's not courses. Mm -hmm. And so you're and you're. The freedom you have to eat around the box, whichever direction you want, there's no prescription for how you begin and end the meal. Of course, there's a kind of prescriptive culture in opening the box and, you know, taking the wrapping off and untying the string and all that, where you and you take out the paper wrap chopsticks and you take out the little um, hand washing cloth, you know, uh, napkin thing, and you all you 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 have a sense, a very personal ritual mm-hmm. that isn't heavily imposed from above. You know, it's just this is how you do it. And then at the end of the, when you finished, you also have a way of wrapping it up again in the original wrapper. It's all provided for that. You know, you do that and then you've tied it up again and deposit it in the proper disposal place uh, at the end of the ride. Um, So there's something very, you know, just right about things. But it's pleasant. (laughs) It's not dictated. Mm -hmm. Inside the box, um, you will uh, you will have many uh, different elements. The again. Not only regional, but seasonal. Mm. So the foods in a box in October coming out of Kyoto, uh, where the the maple leaves turn brilliant oranges and reds, will probably have a piece of this fish paste. It's called kamaboko, Mm -hmm. cut in the shape of a maple leaf, tinged the color the leaves are right now. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, wow. um, there's this sense that, um, you know, that anticipation of the customer's desires, mm-hmm. anticipation of surpri- the surprise on the customer's face when he or she opens the box and says, wow, look at this. Um, it's the same that the mom who makes the child's school bento wants the child to experience when he or she opens that box look what mom made you know and how Mm -hmm. appetizing particularly you know because the mother really wants that child to finish that box 
and not have the teacher say, you have to make a lunch that your child will finish. You know, so <laughs> that That's a quite different bento experience, by the way. But it has this idea that you eat with your eyes that draws you into creating an appetite and helping you to enjoy the box. Mm -hmm. so it's, uh, there's a lot of things to say about um, what goes into it. Um, it could be, it could be um, Western type foods. Mm -hmm. It could be sandwiches, mm -hmm. but they're Japanese sandwiches and Japanese sandwiches would, you know, have the crusts removed. They'd be meticulously made Maybe there would be, you know, sliced tomato and um, a little bit of lettuce or something that the colors are important, even in a Western type sandwich. Uh, there might be um, chicken nuggets, you know, like as if, they were, <laughs> as if they were McDonald's, but they're not. Uh, <laughs> um, but there, there could be any number of things. There could be spaghetti. There could be curry rice. Um, so it's not unknown to have something that, especially a Westerner would say, this isn't Japanese, but it <laughs> is. It's mm -hmm. Japanese style. It's Japanese service. It's Japanese attention to those small things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot going on with bento right now to new technologies of bento making. Um, one of my last trip, which was just before the pandemic, um, there was a, a kind of casserole bento, which was in a ceramic bowl. And it was all wrapped, of course. But when you sit down, you pull this little thing at the bottom and it starts to heat it up. So you uh -huh. have, yeah, it's very safe, of course, but... It, it's like this is a usually a bento is room temperature, whatever. Yeah. But this one has this, you know, jazzy feature of uh, a heating device. That I, So it's constantly changing. And with all the effort um, that goes into these ekiban, they're so high quality. Um, how expensive are they? Are they affordable or... They, they sound expensive in terms of quality to me. <laughs> well, you know, that's such an interesting thing because we regard all that attention that goes into it, as you said, and the techniques of preparation and the, um, and the service that's implied by all of it, the attention to what the customer needs as something luxurious, mm -hmm. as something that would demand money. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, these. there's a range, of course, but I don't think I've ever had a bento that was more than $12. Um, and some of them are as, as cheap as $4, $5. Sure. Um, yeah, uh, they're really not expensive. You might also be buying some beer to have on the train with your lunch, your meal, or very often there's a bottle of green tea, cold, cold green tea that you could have. Um, but basically it's it's everything you need and and almost affordable for, well, I think affordable for pretty much everybody. So you don't see people bringing on homemade food as much, except moms bringing food for toddlers, perhaps. Um, this is so radically different than how we understand eating while traveling here in America. Cause I'm, I mean, people don't take trains so often anymore over here. So I'm kind of comparing this in my mind to airports. And when I think of airport food, I imagine a not very good, probably dry, kind of stale turkey sandwich in a little plastic container. That's like $15. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. And horrible. And now that they don't actually serve meals on planes much anymore, except, you know, boxes or something, um, it's it's dreadful. But yesterday I was coming back on Amtrak from New York to Boston and Penn Station has changed so much. There is actually good food at Penn Station. 
better than airport food. I was shocked and surprised and delighted. Um, but the Amtrak food, you know, the joke is you really want that steamed hot dog on Amtrak, right? With the, <laughs> the marshmallowy bun, you know? <laughs> Yeah, that, but but you do want it. I mean, you crave it because it's part of travel. And I'm I'm really interested in maybe someday I'll do a study of experiences of trains themselves. You know, what do you expect when you travel? And it it travel used to be kind of glamorous, and people would dress up to go on trains, and um, that was my experience in the 1940s and 50s, as people who didn't just put on their sweatpants to get on the train. And they might have a full dress meal on the dining car if they were splurging, and it would be a meal cooked on the train. Um, you know, the, I, certainly in Europe, you can still do that at some of the time, not always. Um, but there are luxury trains which make a point now of remembering the past and putting a... Uh, fancy meal together but that's a premium kind of travel experience that's about uh reca recapturing the past not a normal travel experience so i am thinking that um travel has kind of depreciated in terms of comforts and experience of something special about the travel itself not just getting somewhere but there should be something en route that is, you know, enhances the experience. And certainly in Japan, travel is about the experience uh, itself. So that's another reason why the food should be special. At first, I would think maybe this, associate, this is associated with us being able to travel more quickly. Maybe we prioritize getting there on time over enjoying the journey. But in Japan, they're using bullet trains. These, this is a very fast method of transportation. Right. I think we probably just conceptualize travel differently. Because I don't, I, we do still have road trips today. But I think part of the glamour of going on a road trip is also, oh, I'm going to be pretty uncomfortable this entire time. But it's worth it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's still, even with the discomfort of, you know, traveling with three kids in the back seat in the car, that kind of <laughs> thing, you still have this sense of some kind of getting there is, you know, half the fun, as Greyhound mm -hmm. says, you know, getting there is um, stopping at a special place. There used to be a wonderful book, I think it still exists, by Jane and Michael Stern about eating on the road in America. I think it's just called Road Food. And this idea of seeking out, you know, the cowboy steak or <laughs> seeking out that blueberry pie in Maine that only is on that highway in that place. And there's still a capacity for it, not only food, but things along the route to, mm -hmm. um, to enhance the trip. I think so. Yeah, that's our version of the Eggy Ben. That's you know, right. Looking for a little hole in the wall somewhere in the town that you're visiting, having a local favorite. Yeah. Well, you know, if you go up and down the coast of Maine looking for the greatest lobster roll, you're doing that. <laughs> Absolutely. And so I'd like to um, take us back to the history of all this. Um, so what is the history of the railroad in Japan? The, the trains came to Japan just about the same time they were developing here, um, around the time when the Transcontinental Railroad was put in place in America. Um, and it was a, a period when all new and wonderful things were coming from the West, the 1870s. And um, <clears throat> the uh, trains represented the modern, the new, the aspirational, and they um, they really also did this. They had a role in modernization, which is that they tied the country together. Right, you could get more quickly to different parts. You learned that um, people in a different part of Japan didn't even sound like you. And there was no common language. I mean, it was a common language, but the dialects were so different. The train 
brought together people through carrying newspapers all around the country. So, you know, obviously Tokyo dominated. So the news was created in Tokyo that was then absorbed and consumed elsewhere. But there, so it, it, it didn't homogenize Japan, but it made people aware that there was something else out there besides their hometown. That was one thing. And then um, they also, um, uh, by at, at first, trains were like here, you know, dirty and smelly, and there would be coal dust, and you know, it was kind of unpleasant. So you didn't actually have want to eat on board, and you were, um, you know, it was it was terrible. But there were the first foods uh, in the 18, late eighteen seventies on trains were still sold at the station, and they were rice balls, onigiri, they're called. And rice balls, you know, sometimes wrapped in a banana leaf that would be the, the paper wrapper, as it were. Um, they might have a pickled plum in the center or something just to add flavor. But they were very simple, and they are still a an option for buying at the station, an onigiri or two or three if you want, stuffed with something. Um, so the, the, that was a portable food, and it was a food that was very inexpensive, too. Um, gradually, there was competition, you know, competition to produce something, you know, fancier or more, more desirable. And so people would, the, there was one stop where um, they created a, a cardboard box and, and put different foods in it. Um, foods always had to be um, safe to eat en route, keep for, you know, able to be preserved for hours and hours. Um, so they were, they were quite simple foods, though. And um, the um, elaboration came when trains were more comfortable and went further distances uh, so that there would be a need to eat something on the train. Um, and um, that some of the early trains, the earliest trains went to Yokohama or came from Yokohama. Yokohama was the premier port for the arrival of Western things and Western people in the 19th century. And so some of the foods that started out in Yokohama might have been Western style foods, maybe bread with something in it. Uh, not, not a sandwich as we might know it, but you know, something that had uh, bread or it was called pan, pan in Japanese. Um, so they um, developed the massification of the train market, the consumers, you know, really um, uh, created competition too. So, and there's something, those ekiben, uh, you know, are the result, the diversification and the, you know, proliferation of, of Ekiben is really about the competition that was created because more and more people were traveling and the market was growing and growing. Um, people would uh, sometimes even just buy Ekiben at the station and walk home with it to give to their families, you know, um, because they were very desirable. You would not walk home from an Amtrak train with a steamed hot dog to give to your family. <laughs> but, uh, but these became really desirable uh, commemorative items too. That was the other thing that started to happen was that um, there became, you know, Ekiben clubs, connoisseur clubs of Ekiben and albums that you can buy now that where you put the wrappers of Ekiben you've collected in these albums and you write the date and the train and what's in the Ekiben. And, you know, there's magazines devoted to Ekiben. Um, there's you know, fan clubs all over the place. If you go online, you can find them. And so the Ekiben and the trains have their own fans. And it's, um, it's really, a, it, it's really also there's Ekiben tourism where mm -hmm. you get, a guide and it will be seasonal and the guide will tell you if you go from this station to this station to this station 
and you collect those ekiben. This is this represents this the fall's best ekiben. So people just get on trains in order to collect ekiben. <laughs> So they're in a sense they're like trains to nowhere because they're just about the ekiben. So um, these it, it it's quite an amazing phenomenon um, to an American especially, where as you suggested the idea of uh, pleasure and luxury en route is you know just kind of lost. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to imagine someone taking a bunch of different flights around the United States with different airlines to try their packing, like their peanuts. <laughs> yeah, or their their cookies, their little cookie things. Last fall, or no, it was the spring, I took a flight to Hawaii mm-hmm. and there was nothing but pretzels and peanuts the whole way. <laughs> I mean, you're going to Hawaii, so <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> You know, one of the interesting things that, speaking of airplanes, is that uh, the the airplanes do serve snacks at least, if not meals. And yet, at airports within Japan, domestic flights, you often buy a sora ben. Sora is sky. Mm -hmm. Ben is bento. So the sky box has become a thing that you pick it up at the airport and it's it's really interesting it's it's like airplanes imitating trains yeah so there will be a regional seasonal soda ben not as it's not as much developed as eki ben you know the eating on airplanes is um and trains actually um is is interesting too because you're in close quarters and sharing the air with a lot of people. So in Japan, an ekiben will not have you know an incredibly big smell that when you open it invades the personal space of other people. Um, even even the spaghetti will not have a heavily garlicky sauce. Because you're really, you know, it's supposed to stay within your personal space. So um, a friend who used to go to St. Louis to get, or Kansas City to get barbecue and eat it on the plane on the way back to the East Coast, he, you know, some people would envy him because, you know, this rich barbecue smell. But mm-hmm. some people would just be so offended by mm-hmm. this. So yeah, it, it is attention to other people. Paying attention to other people is a very important Japanese skill. Mm-hmm. So that yep. has to be observed. Yeah. Like you said, being private in public. Exactly. Yeah. So but that you don't you're you're public, but you have to have respect and consideration mm-hmm. for other people. There's a word, omotenashi, which means service, but it means <clears throat> anticipating. The needs of others, omoyari is another word, anticipating the needs of others um, or the sensitivities of others is very important. It's like, it, it's second nature. It doesn't feel like you're, you know, in you're getting some transgression against your individualism to mm-hmm. a lot of other people. But I think Americans, well, some Americans <laughs> might feel it's... Uh, in, uh, it's cons- conscri- conscribing their own freedoms. So in your essay, you mentioned, um, forgive me if I pronounce this wrong, um, whack on your side. Oh, yeah, you've got it right. Um, I got it right. OK, yeah. So whack on your side. Um, <clears throat> it's a, a phrase that came up in the 19th century. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> whack on your side generally means. Um, or meant, no longer is used. It's not a phrase that people use now. Um, um, Western technologies or Western goods, Western things, and Japanese ways or Japanese culture or Japanese spirit or something. So when, for example, the trains came to Japan, 
they very quickly domesticated in becoming something that where, uh, for example, if you did eat on those early trains, there were dining areas on the trains, but not the earliest trains, but the late 19th century, there were dining areas and they were cubicled. The way sometimes now, because of the pandemic, you have little cubicles in restaurants. And so these cubicles were to, to make sure that people could feel private while they're eating and other people wouldn't watch them putting the, having the private act of putting something in your mouth. That is no longer a sensibility that people worry about, but that Japanized the trains, if you will, or domesticated the trains. So walk on your side, um, you know, really you see things like, well, in foods, kare, curry became very Japanese. It came, became sweeter and milder and in a very particular taste. It is no, It does not resemble an Indian curry or even an American version of an Indian curry. It, it is its own thing. So becoming something that comes in uh, was always seen to be imbued with something Japan. It should not necessarily, um, it didn't, the necessity to have it be authentically Western was not there. In fact, quite the opposite. It was important to have it suit Japanese ways. So that's wakon yosai. Um, and yet, I don't think anyone really uses that phrase anymore, uh, yeah, th though it was certainly uh, current um, in um, uh, the ways people thought about new things, um, the way people thought about wearing Western clothes or in the 19th century or uh, <clears throat> using Western furniture. Uh, all of that had a filter added to it. Would you consider the Ekiben to be kind of a fulfillment of that idea? Hmm. That's an interesting question. The Ekiben as a fulfillment of Wakon Yosai, um, I would say that the Ekiben, in that it is eaten on a train um, is kind of the triumph of Japanese ways <laughs> uh, within a form and on a vehicle that might be categorized as Western. Mm. I think that, that the, it's a stretch mm. and, <laughs> I, I think because, because the very idea of Western versus Japanese, it, it, it doesn't have currency. Mm -hmm. um, it did. It did before the war. It mm -hmm. had currency. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what do you think the Ekiben um, symbolizes in modern Japan? The Ekiben, if, if it has a, a wider meaning, than simply the meal you take on a train. I think it is um, the, it, it sort of exemplifies several things. Choice, the mm -hmm. ability of a person to make an individual choice uh, for his or her own pleasure. Mm -hmm. It exemplifies regionalism. It exemplifies seasonality. Mm -hmm. um, it exemplifies the pleasure of travel. Um, it, um, it, it, it's almost invariably an act of pleasure and not just of convenience and necessity. Mm. And I just have um, a few more little questions about how the Ekiben is thought about and used in Japanese um, culture. Are there significant differences between Ekiben marketed for children versus adults? Ekiben for children are an absolute delight. Um, they, uh, they, they 
they really do think about what a child is going to feel when he or she opens the box. And wow. And sometimes the container itself is shaped like, like, you know, I have some that look like Hello Kitty. Oh. Um, I, and, and there's one that, that you can always get, which is just like the engine of a Shinkansen of the bullet train. And oh, wow. Open it up. I have all of these. I have the enormous collection. Um, <laughs> and um, and the uh, uh, food inside is child friendly and mm-hmm. and again regional and seasonal and all that. But it is also you know cute. The word cute, kawaii in Japanese, is a very positive thing. And it's it's not just infantilizing. It's just <clears throat> you know you you cut these little Vienna hot dog sausages so that the ends of them when they're boiled they splay out and they look like an octopus and that's cute or you have the piece of kamaboko with the hello kitty face on it you just go out of your way to make things just adorable and edible and so that um yeah, I mean, you don't you don't have to be a kid to eat these. They they don't restrict you. It's not a kid's menu only. But um, and I'm shameless. I'll buy all these anytime and you know for professional reasons, of course. The, the children's boxes also are very healthy, um, as are adult boxes too. Um, so. <clears throat> The, uh, and those are meant to be taken home, of course, and uh, kept. As a, some of them are actually made to be later used as things like pencil boxes, or so they have that functionality built in. That reminds me of um, they have like souvenir cups or containers at for example if you go to a baseball game yeah. you can get the little kid's sunday that's in a little plastic baseball cap and then they get to take that home as a little souvenir exactly exactly that yeah so um yeah the idea of, of children engaging in the souvenir behavior too not just the adults collecting the wrappers mm-hmm. yeah i think that kind of goes to show how um, in japanese culture traveling in that way they kind of value it and enjoy it the same way we would enjoy going to a sports game, going to some kind of event. Yeah. I think, I think, I think it is an important thing to say that travel is an event. Yeah. And that if you are, um, I mean, of course there's business travel, of course Mm -hmm. there's, you know, travel when a family member is sick in another city and it's not always about, uh, travel for its own sake, but uh, even so, um, travel is also seen um, as something in which you want to mitigate whatever exhaustion travel creates in you. Mm. When you get somewhere and you meet your friends, they say, oh, it's Otsukare sama, which means, oh, you must be so tired. You always mm-hmm. say that to somebody. Um, and um, and of course, you might be a little tired, but so travel is to be mitigated by these pleasures. Mm. So that's an important piece of the Ekiben experience, too. Mm, I see. And um, are Ekiben ever used? Uh, how are Ekiben presented in media? Do they show up in media a lot? Movies, oh, TV yeah. shows? Yeah, yeah, you... Oh, in in anime, you know, um, cartoon shows, you know, the, or manga, um, um, absolutely. They they wouldn't be advertised in the same way on yeah, television or anything because you don't need to advertise them. But they they are uh, a cultural icon. Mm-hmm. So you'd have you know on a kids' television show or something, you'd have. You'd have uh, kids getting on a train with their bento yeah they appear everywhere there's even a, a cartoon no there's maybe it's a live action show i can't remember whether it's a cartoon or a live action show in which this guy travels all over japan eating ekiben and i and it, it is actually a manga so i have several copies of it um so that's a 
a very specific Ekiben manga. It's a series, so it goes on forever. But <laughs> get him going all over Japan uh, with these Ekiben. There are television shows that, in which um, you travel to eat. Thank you all for listening to this week's episode of Roundhouse Crosstalk, a podcast hosted by the California State Railroad Museum. And thank you to Mary White for sitting down with us so we can learn all about Japanese bullet trains and how they relate to food in Japan. Join us again next time, and we'll see you then.